Hello, so this is going to be a video on whether nuclear war could be survivable, which probably sounds like a very grim prospect, and um, one that, we, as we've mentioned before, if it was a full-on exchange between East versus West in the Cold War, then the answer would probably be no. However, what I now want to look at is limited exchanges, or the idea of neutral countries. So, we'll start off with neutral countries, actually. Um, Switzerland is probably the best example of this. Now, Switzerland made a law... I can't remember if it was in the 1950s or 60s, but the idea was that every new house had to be built with uh, basically a fallout shelter or nuclear bunker space for the occupants of the house. And if the house couldn't be built with that, then money had to be provided for um, shelter elsewhere. So basically it was like you pay a, almost like a shelter tax or you build your own shelter. And then each shelter has to have, you know, air filtration and a stockpile of food and I guess be secure well enough underground that it will protect you. Because obviously, when people think of nuclear war, there's two sort of concepts of it. There's the initial people being blown to pieces and cities being completely destroyed by the bombs themselves. And then you've got, like, the fallout and everything like that. Now, the interesting thing with Fallout is it's not depicted very well in media. Especially things like the games like Fallout. But again, they're not meant to be too serious. But after a couple of weeks, the really dangerous high levels of Fallout have significantly decreased. Um, from the radiation, and then, you know, the more time that goes on, the less and less uh, dangerous the actual levels of fallout get. So, for example, if you were to have a stocked shelter with air filtration, and you're able to, you had enough food and water to stay down there for two plus weeks, by the time you come out, you're going to be significantly less in danger of, you know, anything from radiation sickness to cancers than if you'd have gone up straight away or in less time. And then if you had enough food and provisions and whatever to stay down there even longer, um, potentially, you know, it's even safer once you come up. But that's obviously, you know, this is assuming that you're protected from the blast, because obviously a one plus megaton bomb going off in a very close area to you is, you're not going to really have any protection whatsoever from a sort of a bunker, basically. Um, especially not the sort of simple type built under houses, but... For somewhere like Switzerland that's a neutral country, if we're assuming that no nuclear weapons are dropped on Switzerland, then, you know, you can come to the idea that maybe, you know, potentially, as long as they can stay in their shelters till the worst of the radiation has died down, um, it won't be too bad for them. Now, we're going to have to, you know, say we're not going to consider concepts like nuclear winter and all of these things fully in this video. I know some people don't believe nuclear winter's real. It's, you know, as I said before, a scientific theory that scientists argue about whether or not it's real or not. So that's beyond my capability to say if it's real or not. But the point is, with something like um, nuclear winter, if it wasn't being considered or it wasn't very bad, somewhere like Switzerland may be okay. Now, I don't know how much food and water Switzerland can domestically make, um, because obviously that's a big thing as well. If you're a nation reliant on imports of food, and then um, there's nobody left to buy goods from, uh, because they're smouldering rubble, then, yeah, that might be a bit of a problem. So there's always things like that that you have to consider as well, the knock-on effects, which is, you know, like I said, a lot of people consider that there's going to be a bomb, and then everything will be fine if you survive the bomb, whereas there's lots more factors to that. But if we leave it with Switzerland for now, we'll basically say that Switzerland's got a very good idea having sort of fallout shelters in every house, or in a fallout shelter space for everybody. So assuming there was enough warning, and Switzerland especially itself wasn't directly attacked, um, they'd stand a very good chance. Now, the other thing is um, a limited exchange. So <clears throat> what I mean by that is, one of the good pieces of news since the Cold War is that both Russia and the United States have actually been decreasing their nuclear stockpile. Um, compared to the height in the 1980s, each nation has less warheads, and each of the warheads are actually less powerful. The idea is that the guidance systems for those warheads are much better, so that and we have to believe that they're actually giving you know real information on their nuclear weapons, not both pretending that they're cutting down. But the idea is that the nuclear warheads are very accurate, so they don't need to be as powerful. So now lots of the warheads are in you know the 100 to 200 kiloton range. Um, which is, um, you know, thousands of tons still, um, but it's still hundreds of thousands of tons even, but it's still, you know, not in the megaton range of millions of tons. Um, they probably still do have megaton weapons, but the point is that they're cutting back on them. And I think that's good for everybody, isn't it? That if there was a nuclear war, 
there's a lot less total megatons falling on everybody if each nation is using more accurate guidance systems and they're shooting less nuclear weapons at each other and each of those nuclear weapons is less powerful that's sort of a good thing in you know my eyes at least it's not a good thing but it's better than the alternative of hundreds if not thousands of megatons hitting everywhere so in that way it's good I mean if you're in a very densely populated country like Britain uh, it's probably still not very good news for you news for you because there's still going to be lots of people who live near barracks and air bases and uh, important military targets but if you're in bigger countries, even if they had targets, let's say United States or Russia, if you didn't live in the uh, in, you know direct areas that would be targeted, your odds suddenly become a lot better because the explosions might be you know a quarter of the size, a tenth of the size, or whatever, and there's less of them. So there's going to be less bombs making less fallout. Now, of course, if even a lower kiloton weapon ground bursts, it's still going to make a lot of radiation. Um, so there's factors like that to consider as well. So now let's look at either of these two situations where you're either in somewhere that's not really going to get bombed and you have some, some sort of fallout shelter, or you live in a country that is going to get bombed but you live far enough away from any targets that you don't have to worry about the direct effect of the blast, only fallout. So the best thing you could do is if you have a basement, let's assume we're not in Switzerland anymore where they have the proper fallout shelters, because if you're in that situation you're fine, you're, you know, You've got your basement with your food and water stockpiles and your air filtration. So you basically just lock yourself in for a couple of weeks and hope for the best. Whereas, if you're in a country where you don't have a dedicated fallout shelter and you don't have the money to build a dedicated fallout shelter, what could you do? Now, if you've got a basement or cellar, that's the best thing. Because, obviously, we're going to assume there's going to be alpha, beta and gamma radiation from the blast. Although, fallout is mostly alpha radiation from what everything I've read. Because it's the actual radiated dust you risk, uh, you risk inhaling or eating that's going to um, get inside your body and cause lots of damage. But anyway, let's just talk about radiation in general, alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, if you're further down, um, you know, behind concrete or brick or whatever, then there's less of that radiation that can potentially get in. And that means, you know, better chances of you not getting radiation sickness or cancers and whatever else from the radiation. So... Um, and you could potentially, you know, make your lean-to in your basement. I know people laugh at the lean-to because they see it in things like threads where the houses are totally destroyed and lean-to would offer no protection. But a lean-to shelter itself, if it's inside a building that's not going to totally collapse, actually does help block a lot of the radiation because you've got a lot more material on top of where you're going to be. And obviously, um, the more material between you and the radiation is a good thing. That's the general, you know, concept to avoid radiation exposure pretty much since forever, is the more stuff that's blocking the radiation from getting to you, the better. So, you know, a lean-to in a basement or getting a load of tables in the basement then putting bags on top of them and getting under the tables is actually better than, um, you know, just being out in the middle of the basement. But in general, um, you know, the further away and the more material there is between you and the radiation or the fallout, um, the better your chances are. Now, if you've got a Geiger counter or dosimeter is very good, because then you can actually see what radiation is getting in, you know, to where you are, and potentially if you might need to evacuate, although in a fallout scenario evacuating might be even more dangerous because you're just going to expose yourself to even more radiation if you go outside, but, you know, it gives you an idea if the levels inside are getting maybe a bit too dangerous. Um, also, obviously, masks. If you did need to go outside into the fallout dust area, then obviously having a mask to prevent you from inhaling all of that dust is going to, you know, massively increase your chances. Not loads to say about that one, but it's fairly obvious. For if for whatever reason you didn't need to go outside, I'd much rather have the basic protective equipment on than nothing. Um, thick clothing as well can block some of the beta radiation, but certainly block the alpha radiation, although your skin will block alpha radiation, assuming it's not got cuts on it. Um, but yeah, the main concept is you'd want to be in a basement or somewhere that's as far away from windows and roofs as possible. You know, you're in a refuge. Um, then when you're in there, um, you obviously want to have enough water and food. Um, hopefully some sort of toilet system. Um, you know, like a chemical toilet type thing would be good. Because the idea is that, you know, um, you need to keep yourself hydrated and fed so you don't starve and it keeps up your body's energy. But you also um, need to have sanitation in place, because otherwise it might be that you die of something like um, cholera or something, rather than dying of acute radiation syndrome. But, you know, there's that. So, in this way, 
it might be survivable, but as I said, if you watch something like Fred, you'll see that in a massive exchange of nuclear weapons, you probably wouldn't want to survive because you're just going to have a very bleak and horrible existence until you do eventually die anyway, so there's that. But the point is that, you know, when it comes to um, survivable nuclear war, I don't think it's a completely out of place idea. The other thing as well is what if two nuclear powered nations and you're not in any either of them um, strike each other, your country's not affected, lots of other countries aren't affected. Um, let's say um, India and Pakistan have a nuclear exchange or for example North Korea fires a couple of nuclear weapons at South Korea. Um, in a scenario like that if you lived elsewhere in the world you might have to only risk, you know, the only risk would be fallout. And then in that scenario, um, you know, that's where potentially, again, if you've got somewhere you can get into, you're going to have enough warning. If you've stop been stockpiling food and water and, you know, have been sensible, then you probably do stand an alright chance. Um, you know, in a similar way to if some sort of nuclear weapon went off somewhere um, and the fallout was spreading your way, or even if it was just a test done somewhere and fallout was spreading your way, you know, if, as long as you've got a thing to get into, then you're a bit better off. Now, obviously, there's a difference between fallout and radiation from nuclear weapons than there is from something like the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, because when Chernobyl happened and the nuclear fuel itself was burning, that's where there's going to be, you know, half-life of potentially thousands of years before the radiation goes away. With nuclear weapons, as I said, the worst of it's generally over in a couple of weeks, you know, and the longer you leave it, the better your chances are. So bear in mind that not all um, nuclear disasters are created equal in that sense. Uh, but I, hopefully you found the video interesting. I said it's always a grim subject, but it's actually a pretty fascinating one. And it goes a lot deeper than you might expect if you just, you know, think of big nuclear bomb going off. Anybody that's not initially caught in it is fine or whatever like that. Yeah, it's a lot more complicated than that.